Hello, I'm Dr. Jack McDonough, Chairman of the Advisory Board of the Henry R. Winkler Center for the History of the Health Professions at the University of Cincinnati College of Medicine. The Winkler Center is a medical archive, library, and exhibits gallery that encourages visitors and researchers to explore and examine the Cincinnati area's rich medical history and discover the people who contributed important advances in medicine, nursing, and the pharmaceutical sciences. One of the real gems of our collection is the video oral history program. The histories and stories that we've collected from many of these remarkable pioneers are fascinating. We wonder sometimes how they made their discoveries. What pushed them to become leaders in their fields and even what their lives were like outside their offices and laboratories. Today, we are going to interview Dr. Robert Hummel, Professor Emeritus of Surgery and former Vice Chair of the Department and former Chief of the Medical Staff at the University Hospital. Dr. Hummel is a 1947 graduate of Xavier University and received his MD at the University of Cincinnati in 1951. He completed his internship at Duke University Hospital and then returned to Cincinnati for a surgical residency at Cincinnati General Hospital. Called to active duty during his residency, he spent two years as chief of the burn study section at the Surgical Research Unit, Brook Army Medical Center, Fort Sam Houston in San Antonio, Texas. He returned to Cincinnati, completing his residency as a chief resident in 1960 and began his illustrious career as a surgeon, educator, and researcher in burns and surgical infections. Tomorrow, the Mont Reed Surgical Society of the University of Cincinnati will honor Dr. Hummel as its second annual Mont Reed Surgical Society visiting professor. He will speak on the history of the Department of Surgery at UC at Surgical Grand Rounds. Let's welcome Dr. Hummel as he talks about his career and the history of the UC Department of Surgery. Welcome. I'm Dr. Jack McDonough, the Chairman of the Advisory Board for the Winkler Center for the History of the Health Professions. And today we're going to interview Dr. Robert Hummel, Professor Emeritus of Surgery former vice chair of the Department of Surgery and former chief of staff of the University Hospital. Bob, you've had a fascinating career as a surgeon, researcher, and educator. Over 45 years of rapid change in surgical science and the provision and delivery of health care. A time of great upheaval in medicine's culture as well as financially. But you've had a lot of close friendships with many of the famous lights in surgery, so we're going to begin. You were born in Bellevue, Kentucky on September 27, 1928. Your father was a businessman and a politician, sure. uh, mayor of Bellevue, Kentucky, <clears throat> and later water commissioner of Campbell County, Kentucky. Your mother was a homemaker. Sure. And did you have any brothers or sisters? None. None, okay. Uh, you graduated cum laude from Xavier University in 1947, but you were 18 years old when Eight, you graduated? 18, yes. So that made you about uh, 14 when you went to college? 15, 15 actually. We, uh, it was an accelerated program, so you just went to school all year. Oh. By the time I was 17, I'd had three years of college. Oh, wow. Um, and then you graduated from UC College of Medicine in 1951. Your internship was at Duke University Hospital in Durham, North Carolina, and you began your residency at the Cincinnati General Hospital in 1951. And that was apparently interrupted by two uh, years. Actually, it was 52. 52? <laughs> Close okay. enough. Well, yeah. <laughs> um, and that was apparently interrupted by two years as chief of the burn section at Brook Army Medical Center in San Antonio, Texas. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Um, uh, the, uh, they instituted a doctor draft back in those days, which most people don't remember, but in the Korean War they were short of doctors and so they passed a law and any doctor who hadn't been in the army of a certain age was subject to the doctor draft. And um, uh, uh, I, of course, had not been and uh, uh, so I was uh, drafted into the army and um, 
went in as a first lieutenant, became a captain a little while after that. But um, <clears throat> I was in San Antonio, uh, Texas, for six weeks of basic training. And, um, and they told us that the great majority of us would be going over to Korea, almost all of us. Uh, uh, the war was actually over as far as the shooting went, but they were uh, uh, still at the peace t uh, conference and that sort of thing. So that didn't sound very exciting to me. I'd uh, be at a base hospital with a bunch of healthy young men to take care of. So I was talking to my father and mentioned it to him that that's probably what was going to happen and and uh, that I would rather be someplace more interesting than that. And so he, he knew a, couple, uh, a general or two and... Uh, uh, they made a phone call or two, and before I know it, I was, uh, tra I was um, stationed at Brook Army uh, Burn Center, which was brand new in those days. It had been a mass unit over in Korea. And they came back, and the Army decided to have a burn center for all military burn injuries. So this was the beginning of that, and uh, I was the first one from Cincinnati to be there. That's, that's a longer story if you want to get into that at some other point. Okay. Uh, then you returned to Cincinnati, finishing your residency in 1960, and uh, part of that residency, you were married to Helen. Uh, that's right. Uh, <clears throat> what happened to that policy of no marriage during your residency? That was pretty much long gone by then, um, <clears throat> but it had been, uh, it was true that uh, for many, many years, um, uh, th there was a, a rule against being married. I mean, when you were a resident surgeon, that means you were in residence at the hospital. They expected you to live there. Uh, and uh, they had, you had your own room, but you weren't supposed to be married and going elsewhere. I think the rumor is that one of the first people married uh, secretly was uh, Dan Early, who was uh, uh, actually in the Second World War in the uh, unit that went from UC over, overseas, and uh, that uh, they found out later on, but by that time they didn't care. And, and pretty much by the time I came along, uh, a good number of the residents were, were married. Mm -hmm. And I think that uh, there was uh, a history that uh, Hoyer and Mont Reed used to try to fix the uh, residents up with uh, a very eligible young ladies. <coughs> they did. They, uh, they had, uh, there were volunteers in those days and, uh, that would work in the surgery clinic as, uh, as clerks. And wh what they did uh, is uh, they got the uh, ladies from the Junior League, uh, which were the, um, in those days, were sort of the... Uh, uh, elite ladies and uh, unmarried ladies in the in the city, uh, and uh, had them uh, work at the in the surgery clinic so they get to know the doctors and hope that good things came of that. <laughs> um, well, with regard to the history of the department, uh, maybe we should begin at the very beginning and uh, talk about Dr. Daniel Drake. <clears throat> Dr. Drake's very interesting character and a very important one in the uh, history of the University of Cincinnati. Uh, he came to Cincinnati at the age of 15 in uh, 1800. His dad brought him down from Kentucky to apprentice with Dr. Goforth, who was the leading doctor in Cincinnati at that time. And, and that's pretty much the way medical education was in those days. You apprenticed with an established uh, doctor. And so he uh, apprenticed with him for two or three years and then uh, was given by Dr. Goforth his certificate and went into practice was dissatisfied with his knowledge base and went to the University of Pennsylvania for a number of years and came back. But how he, the important thing is that from the state of Ohio, he obtained three charters. One charter to establish the uh, university, the College of Cincinnati University, uh, or I just call it the Cincinnati College. Uh, this was in 1819. And the other was to establish a medical school. And the third, which he got in 1821, was for a commercial uh, hospital to uh, go along with the uh, medical school. Uh, and uh, so when you see the University of Cincinnati established 1819, that's when Drake got the charter mm -hmm. for, the, uh, for the school. And the important thing in the charter for the um, hospital, it, it was the first linkage ever of indigent care with uh, medical teaching. They, the charter stated that the hospital uh, was run by, it could be run by the professors, at the, t the teaching professors, uh, and, uh, and to take care of the patients. In return for that, they could bring their students into the hospital. So it really was the first teaching hospital in the United States. Uh, University of Michigan makes that claim, but actually this predated Michigan by 50 years. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, the very first 
a chief of surgery at Miami Medical College, which actually became the College of Medicine, uh, was uh, Dr. Mussey. That's true. And we are just delighted to have Dr. Mussey's entire library here at the Winkler Center. And uh, it's, it's very, very impressive. Um, so in the, let's see, it would have been in the 20s, uh, several of uh, Halstead's residents showed up from Baltimore and George Hoyer uh, was the first one, and I think he brought along Mont Reed with him. Is that correct? That's correct. Now that now you're, you're we're skipping about a hundred years. From, oh, uh, from let's go back then. I'm now, sorry. no, no. Now we're in we're in 1922, uh, and we had the Hopkins invasion. Uh, <clears throat> the uh, following uh, the, the, the the university, the Pavilion University Hospital was built in 19, uh, 19, 1915, along with the College of Medicine building. And uh, that was a result of the uh, Flexner Report on the sad state of medical education and practice in the United States. <clears throat> so they built the hospital and then the university decided that they'd try to have a full-time surgical staff and uh, eventually in a total university uh, full-time staff patterned after Johns Hopkins. So they brought um, Mont Reed and uh, Carter uh, and um, uh, Hoyer was Hoyer was the, the chairman. Um, uh, Mont Reed was the assistant uh, professor, and um, uh, Carter was the chief resident. They also brought Zinninger and uh, two other uh, residents along with them. Uh, the whole concept was that they would be a, a full-time staff, and that caused a tremendous amount of rancor and upset within the community of other surgeons outside the university. Mm -hmm. Um, and I believe that there were several suits by <coughs> there was, against yes, the yeah, Hoyer. There, uh, Hoyer was, uh, he was a much better trained surgeon than anybody in town, and he let them all know it. Mm -hmm. uh, he uh, was getting rid of the surgeons from the uh, 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 uni university, and the general hospital staff uh, related to the university, and so they were very upset with him. Uh, <coughs> and... Um, so they sued over the, uh, the, what had happened was the, the university had promised um, Hoyer that he could have a ward, uh, what they'd call it the research and private patient ward, where he could have private patients in the general hospital mm -hmm. uh, and develop a, a whole faculty, and the faculty could have private patients there too. Well, that's what they sued about. They said the charter said it could only be for indigent care. Mm -hmm. And it went all the way to the Supreme Court, and they decided against the university that they could only have... Uh, indigent care there and no, no private patients. So that really destroyed the concept of the uh, f uh, total full-time staff at the, uh, at the general hospital. Uh, if it had gone the other way, um, we probably would have had a university full-time hospital staff here before anybody else in the Midwest and, and you know, I don't know what would have happened from there. Right. Yeah, well, that must have been the uh, genesis for the Holmes Hospital then. It was, right? it was. Uh, <clears throat> since they couldn't admit patients to the general hospital, for a while they admitted them to Jewish Hospital, and then they built uh, two years. Uh, Hoyer had been here about two years, or two years after the suit, I think. The suit was settled in 24, and I think like in 26, they built the Holmes Hospital for private patients. Mm -hmm. I didn't mean to, to gloss over that 100 years, but I don't know anything about it, do you? <laughs> do you know something about it? Uh, well, uh, the only um, uh, outside of, um, uh, uh, there are a lot of, um, they, they built a couple of hospitals during that time. The, the um, first hospital was relatively small, built in the early 20s. Uh, but then in uh, uh, about 60, 1869, they built a very large uh, uh, Cincinnati Commercial Hospital and Lunatic Asylum mm -hmm. on uh, what is now Central Parkway. Okay. It used to be the canal. And uh, the only thing interesting there is they, they did have uh, house surgeons, the first residents, who made uh, $400 a year. And I, I came along 125 years later and I made $600 a year. <laughs> <laughs> A princely sum indeed. Yeah. So uh, Hoyer was uh, here as chairman until I think the 30s, early 30s, wasn't he? And then he moved on to Cornell. That's right. He moved on to, <coughs> to New York and um, 
uh, Mont Reed was, uh, he'd been here about 10 years, I think. Yeah. And Mont Reed was uh, appointed in his uh, place and, and did a very good job and did a lot to mend uh, the town gown relationship. Uh, he was popular and friendly and got along well with people. And, uh, but unfortunately, uh, I don't remember the exact date, but he didn't, he, he, I don't think he made 10 years before he had a heart failure and passed away. Mm, I think it was 43 sometime. It, it was, I think. Uh, what, do, you, do we have any idea why Hoyer left Cincinnati to go to Cornell, better job, better pay, or just he um, too much trouble? I, I think he had, uh, the animosity here in town was getting to him, and uh, uh, it, was a very, it was a good opportunity in New York. He was going to be chairman and establish a, a full-time situation up there and be the first, the first Halstead-trained uh, surgeon in New York. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of reasons. Uh, I, I was reviewing a, a, uh, our DVD of Dr. William Altemeyer uh, over the weekend, and Dr. Altemeyer talked about Dr. Hoyer and mentioned that he was uh, rather short of stature. I think about 5'4", five, 5'5". Five, yeah, five, like they that. said that, but I've seen pictures of him, and he does not look quite that short. He, yeah. uh, he certainly wasn't tall, but, uh, yeah. but uh, I, I knew how tall uh, Nick Carter was, who was probably average size or a little, little even better, and uh, he was almost up to. So really? I, he might have been five six or something, but oh, I don't okay. think he was a dwarf. By <laughs> <means>. <laughs> well, so not. Um, so after uh, Mont Reed passed away, Max Sinninger took over. He did. Um, <clears throat> uh, everybody wanted Nick Carter to be chairman, but he was off. Uh, the Second World War was on, and he was in the. The surgeon, surgeon uh, office. He was um, uh, instrumental and important in the war effort, and so he was actually in the army. And so uh, Max took the job on a, a temporary basis for about mm -hmm. three years, I think. Well, it was. I think it was interesting to hear Dr. Aldemar talk about Hoyer and what he did. He did neurosurgery, he did chest surgery, abdominal surgery. Um, uh, Mont Reed did s most of that stuff as well, uh, and well, uh, that's why that's why, uh, and that's why our res the residency was set up in the old days. It, it was a seven-year program, you know, internship plus six, and that the six could often be seven or eight, depending on whether you took a year in the lab or whether you weren't. They didn't think you were quite ready to be chief, and mm -hmm. they might delay you another year. Uh, because you, you rotate it, you take six months on gin and six months on fractures and six months on neurosurgery with the idea that uh, you could really do all those things. You know, mm -hmm. Nowadays that seems pretty ridiculous, but, but in those days uh, they did really branch out into almost all the specialty areas. And uh, <coughs> Max Zinninger was ch interim chair for about three years, mm -hmm. and then Nick Carter came back from the war, I think right. in 46 or 47. Right. Uh, having served very uh, uh, nicely in the Surgeon General's office, right. as you mentioned. Um, so Carter took over, and he was chair from about 47 to 52. Two. Two, he was. Uh, and, you know, he just disappeared after that. He did. Uh, nobody has ever <coughs> really been too clear on why he <coughs> quits early. He was only, I think, around 57 years old when he retired. Now, he, he did come from a relatively wealthy and well-known Virginia family. His, his married, he married a lady who was wealthy. And uh, they kind of retired and toured the, toured the world. And, uh, but um, it, it seems strange because he was so into things, mm -hmm. uh, both locally and nationally, and was developing a lot of programs at the university. Uh, and then it just kind of all stopped. Right. And he was a very accomplished surgeon from a, he, uh, Yes, he was. He was very uh, good. His son, Lee Carter, gave us a bound volume of all of his papers. Uh -huh. And I looked through that uh, when Lee donated it. And, uh, I mean, he's got uh, papers on chest surgery and uh, some early heart traumatic heart surgery. I mean, incredible stuff oh, yeah. that uh, mm -hmm. you're really amazed that he just literally vanished almost. Mm -hmm. They did. <coughs> and um, so then Dr. Altemeyer came on board in uh, 1952. That's right. And uh, I understand that both you and he started at the same time. <laughs> we did. Uh, I came back from Duke. Uh, I had interned down there and uh, came back uh, for the surgical residency here. And he, uh, he uh, took the chairman's office the same, at the, practically the same time. Mm -hmm. And we did talk a little bit about earlier that there were some members of the department that weren't too happy when Bill Altamar got the job. No, I th <coughs> number one, I think 
practically everyone in the department considered themselves a candidate for the job. Mm -hmm. um, and he and Bill was younger than, a, than many of them, uh, and um, had not trained here. Mm -hmm. Trained at Henry Ford, and uh, a lot of them considered him sort of an upstart. Mm -hmm. But uh, Bill had uh, a lot of grants on antibiotic uh, research. Uh, uh, he was uh, on uh, the several committees at the NIH. He had written a lot of papers. Uh, he did much more research than anybody else mm -hmm. in the department. And uh, he actually, in uh, looking at it, he was pretty much a logical choice for an internal right. candidate. And uh, you realize as we're going along, we've had no external candidate, no external candidates at all. We've had the three guys, four guys, who arrived from Hopkins, and then Altmaier, who was already on the faculty here. And th there just wasn't any, um, aside from the fact that all these people were good, uh, there really wasn't any money, if you will, to attract an outside because of the fact that it was not a full-time system. Mm -hmm. that it was, uh, <clears throat> there was, uh, these were, all the faculty were basically entrepreneurs who signed out to each other, but they were all in separate practices. Right. Well, uh, when you were a resident, I would assume it was uh, pretty much like when I was a resident, that uh, the general hospital was considered a residence hospital. Exactly. And staff participation or involvement in actual cases was the exception rather than the rule. Is that correct? That's true. Um, <clears throat> uh, Dr. Altmaier scrubbed with, the chief, with one of the two chief residents at the general every Thursday. Mm -hmm. Other than that, uh, you might see another faculty man in there helping once or twice a week, but you'd, three, four days in a row, there'd never be a, a faculty member in the operating room. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was resident, teaching resident. Now, right. the, the chief residents were in their seventh year of training. Right. I mean, they were well-trained and, and good teachers, but um, it was resident helping resident and, and training each other. And you know the old saying that the residents had about when there was a new procedure to mm -hmm. be learned? It's a uh, uh, see one, do one, mm -hmm. teach one, expert. <laughs> right. Yes, I, I do remember that. <laughs> um, well, when you became a resident, what was the call schedule like in 1950? Uh, the call schedule um, was for uh, most of the rotations, like at uh, the all the general surgery rotations at the uh, university and even at the VA when that came on board. Um, and... Um, uh, where it was two out of three nights, two nights uh, every day on, uh, two nights on and one night off. So you're off two nights a week or some weeks you might be three. But, uh, but it was, and on a lot of surfaces it wasn't that tough. Uh, but on emergency surgery, it was like SEAL training before there were SEALs. I uh -huh. mean, you, you could be up working and on your feet and, and jumping from emergency room to operating room and back and forth to recovery uh, for 48 hours in a row without ever seeing your room or seeing a bed. I mean, it, mm -hmm. was, it was really hard work. And um, uh, later on, I think they cut it from six months to four month rotations. Uh, but um, I know a lot of, some of the guys just physically couldn't make it. We had guys that who just had to <clears throat> take off a couple of weeks or so at some point mm -hmm. along the line. It was very difficult. I would assume for somebody who was married and maybe even had small children, it must have been... It was very... Dark. Yeah, I put a lot <clears throat> of pressure on the wife. Yeah. The kids were probably asking where daddy is a lot. A lot. And on top of that, the guys are making 40 or... I mean, 50 or $75 a month, and mama had to work. Yeah, right. Yeah, that, that's, that's true. Um, so what was your salary? Four, four hundred or six hundred dollars? Yeah, started at fifty dollars a month, and then after a year or two, it was seventy-five dollars a month. And when you got to be chief resident, it was like one hundred and fifty dollars a month. Uh -huh. And the VA paid a little more than that. Uh, and um, I fortunately had the GI Bill right. uh, since I was in the Army for uh, and uh, uh, the surgery training was considered a graduate school of surgery, so you were under the university auspices. Mm -hmm. And so you could collect the GI Bill, which was another 100 yeah. a month or something. Yeah, right, yeah. yeah. It hadn't changed in 1975 <laughs> yeah. when I got out of the, or yeah. uh, 70, when I, I got out of the Navy. Um, when I was talking, or not talking, but when I was listening to the DVD by Dr. Altemeyer, he mentioned that at one part of his very early career, he had to call in Paul Hawksworth and uh, Hoppy Seiler 
uh, and have a come to Jesus talk with them about the fist fights that they were <laughs> having. And do you recall any of this or not? I don't recall fist fights. I know that um, there was great animosity between those two. Uh, I haven't been able to check it. I haven't been able to find the records, but I think they were both chief residents together. Mm -hmm. In those days, there were only two chiefs, one on male, one on female surgery, and that was, that was it. Um, and uh, it was probably around 1940 or 41 or someplace they were, they were chiefs. And they didn't get along then. Mm -hmm. And uh, then they were always in competition for patients, you know, and um, uh, Hoppy had a much more elite clientele. Um, but they, they, uh, they tolerated each other in later years. But they, I don't think they, you would ever say they were friends. Mm -hmm. Well, it sounds like Dr. Hawks, Hawksworth had some anger management problems. <laughs> <laughs> he did. He was uh, uh, one person that nobody wanted to help in the operating room. I mm -hmm. mean, he really was a difficult uh, a surgeon. He had a, he had a temper and he got upset easily. He was not the greatest technical surgeon in the world. Um, and I think there was some insecurity there, and mm -hmm, um, sure. uh, I, I, that contributed to it. Uh, he actually could be, uh, although he was, he could be pretty surly and nasty at meetings and things like that. He, he had a warm side and pleasant side to him too. Oh sure, I, I remember him well. Yeah, but he really did make a contribution to the uh, university and to medical health with uh, the blood supply. He really did. Uh, he was he was a uh, uh, pioneer in blood transfusions and. Uh, and started the blood bank here very early on. Did a lot of work on uh, uh, plasmas and serums and things like that, and uh, uh, built the blood bank. And uh, I, I think did a did a wonderful job with that. Mm -hmm. Well, during your period, a lot of your professors were actually guys who had done the residency, like Gene Stevenson, Bill Culbertson, Siler Hawksworth, and uh, I guess Eddie McGrath was probably a resident. Uh, John Wilson. Uh, tell us a little bit about those folks that you recall. <clears throat> well, let's see. Um, uh, you mentioned Gene Stevenson, who was a perfect gentleman and a wonderful guy. He was the slowest operator you'd ever run across. Oh, no. I mean, he was meticulous. Uh, uh, the same for people like him. It, it took him uh, two hours to watch 60 minutes. You know, <laughs> <laughs> um, he uh, he really was very. But it was a good surgeon. But an eight-hour radical mastectomy right, yeah, was not that. unusual at all. Yeah, um, uh, but a very nice fellow. A little bit to the right of Attila the Hun. That's uh, true. I remember socially, that. Socially, <laughs> but uh, uh, and um, uh, Siler was um, a good fella and um, was very good at certain things. He was a wonderful thyroid surgeon. Mm -hmm. He was a wonderful hand surgeon. He was right. a pioneer in hand surgery and started the hand uh, society. Uh, and uh, breast surgery, very good at that. In fact, uh, Hawksworth uh, called him a surface surgeon. He oh, said, right. oh, you do all that surface stuff, you know. <laughs> you don't really get in there like I do. <laughs> <coughs> uh, and, uh, but, um, and he also, uh, Hoppy uh, was the Indian Hill um, surgeon of choice. You know, I think his name was on every refrigerator in Indian Hill. Oh, yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. And um, <coughs> one of the problems with the, everybody being an entrepreneur is that uh, here was Siler, who was probably much better at doing thyroids than Hawksworth, and Hawksworth, who was probably much better at doing a colon than, than Siler. But if they got referred uh, thyroid or, you know, uh, vice versa, they wouldn't say, oh, no, I, send that to Hoppy right. or, no, I'll, I'll, you know, he'd say, oh, send the colon to Hoppy. They didn't do that. You know, right. they, they kept them. They did them. <laughs> Well, I, I remember when I was a resident, and people nowadays would not believe this, but it actually happened. Um, we did a very well-to-do lady from Minden Hill and took her gallbladder out one evening. And the next day when Dr. Seiler came to make his rounds, he had this little entourage of residents and interns and medical students, and we were standing behind him, and he came in and he said, Emma, I am so glad we got to you in time. That gallbladder, inflamed gallbladder, is pointing right at your heart. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, Emma said, "Oh, Doctor Seiler, you're just so wonderful." <laughs> That's right. That's right. And the the fee doubled right there. <laughs> <laughs> and when he had an infection, he would change the dressings himself. Yes. With a towel over the patient's face, mm -hmm. so they never really knew they had an infection. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the other thing I remember is. Uh, 
when I was a chief resident, I think it was Dan Whiteley. No, I was a resident. Dan Whiteley or one of those guys, uh, we were making rounds with Dr. Hawksworth. And it was Ed Burkage. And uh, we would always show him the complicated cases, you know, the really terrible things that right. went on. We'd always show Hawksworth that. So one day I asked Burkage, I said, how come we always call Dr. Hawksworth on these complications? He said, because he's had every one of them. That's right. <laughs> he, was, he was famous for having a lot of complications and was good at taking care of them. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, Hoppy was actually um, uh, president of the American Society for Surgery of the Hand yes. back in the uh, 60s. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, that's, actually, he was one of the guys that got me interested in hand he surgery. Yeah. Uh, and then John Wilson was, we think, in the department during that time. <laughs> John was he, another nice guy who uh, kind of drifted in and out. And um, uh, I always kidded John. I said, well, you know, John, your most famous paper that you ever wrote uh -huh. uh, was one on uh, the effect of jogging on the female breast. <laughs> oh, Remember that? Right. And um, <clears throat> it was when jogging was just coming in, you know. Right, yeah. And he wrote about what would happen, and uh, I think the sports bra came out of that. <laughs> <laughs> that I think it did. I think it did. <laughs> and then there was uh, uh, Louis Herman. Louis Herman was a uh, vascular surgeon. Uh, before there was really true vascular surgery, I mean, Louis did veins mainly, varicose veins and that sort of thing, and uh, amputations for gangrenous feet. And that. But <clears throat> by the time the um, uh, arterial... Um, bypasses and that sort of thing were coming along he he kind of didn't get into that he was on his way he was backing away by then and mm -hmm. so he was not a really active vascular surgeon but a very very good at what he did yeah, and eddie mcgrath he, he was eddie a McGrath, general surgeon he was he did, <coughs> did chest surgery chest. mainly yeah uh -huh. he, he was um uh, one of the first time i rotated at dunham hospital dunham hospital was the tb hospital right. here and uh, we rotated a surgical resident and two or three interns out there um, and uh, he was uh, attending and helped mm -hmm. me do some pneumonectomies, right? No, low backtomies. Um, well, uh, Dr. Olimar came on board and really developed it into a more research uh, uh, department. Um, and when you came on the faculty as an assistant professor, were you geographic full time? That, that's what everybody was, geographic full. The salaries were negligible. Right. Uh, I had a big salary. I had 12000 a year uh -huh. uh, because I was the attending surgeon at Drake Hospital. Oh, okay. They, that was <clears throat> how they were able to give me any salary at all. Right. Bill Altmeyer told me his salary was 12000 a year right. in 1960. Uh -huh. um, and it probably was. I think the whole departmental budget was under two hundred thousand. You know, mm -hmm. it was very small yeah. and because they just wasn't any money. And so the agreement was: <clears throat> you were supposed to spend one third of your time teaching, one third in research, and one third in private practice. Mm -hmm. It very seldom worked out that way. You right. know, most of the guys were at least half time in private practice. Mm -hmm. But you did have to spend a fair amount of time with the residents and uh, you know, just committees alone. Um, I remember I, I stopped and figured it out one time when I hadn't been here that long, maybe eight or 10 years, that I was on 25 committees between the, between the university hospital, the VA hospital, the medical school, the children's hospital, and the Drake hospital. I was on 25 committees. Mm -hmm. and, uh, oh, I believe it. I believe it. <clears throat> and it took a lot of time. Um, so you were paid a salary. You were allowed to have a private practice. And I <clears throat> know that Dr. Altamire had a busy private practice. He did have a busy private practice. Not only at the Holmes, but out at St. Francis in he, Western he, Hills. Right. He lived out in Western Hills. <laughs> right. So it was very convenient for him to stop morning and night at St. Francis. To and make see rounds. patients and make rounds. Mm -hmm. And uh, so he always had uh, some patients out there. Now, when you were uh, er, in your younger days in the department, when, when uh, Dr. Olimar was chair, you worked with uh, guys like uh, uh, Dick Vilter, mm -hmm. uh, uh, Felson, Wyatt, Gall. Any remembrances particularly about those folks? <coughs> they were all very interesting guys. I, I knew um, uh, Ed Gall. I knew, well, as a medical student, he, was, he taught when I rotated through surgical pathology, which we did in those days. Uh, he, you know, I spent a lot of time with him then. Uh, very good pathologist. Um, uh, Jerry Wyatt, I knew. <laughs> I knew Jerry since he was a, a sophomore medical student. I think he, he and I were pretty close to the same age. But because I would got out of school so early, I was a first year resident when he was a first year, second year resident when he was a junior 
medical student. And we were both dating uh, girls who lived together, nurses who lived, who shared an apartment. Uh -huh. So we'd run into each other all the time. Oh. And so I've known, I knew, knew Jerry for many, many years. Uh, Felson was a great radiologist, really a groundbreaker. And uh, uh, he and Jerry both ran a wonderful uh, department of radiology. And mm. Vilter, of course, uh, I think Vilter probably um, uh, I knew from medical student days because he was um, even, he, he was a, um, I, I think I interviewed with him before coming to medical school. He was an so assistant dean or something, oh, okay. part-time assistant dean when he was in the Department of Medicine. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and he, of course, was very well-known and well-established uh, internist. And then in 1978, along came Joe Fisher. That's right. And uh, I, uh, we'll talk a lot about that. Um, I would just like to preface this by the fact that when Joe retired from the Department of Surgery, they gave him a grand send-off at the Cincinnati Country Club, a uh, dinner for about 300 people. And uh, I was honored with offering the first toast of the evening when the evening was just starting. And so I got up and looked out at this crowd and looked at Joe about four tables away and I thought, I hope he likes this. <laughs> <clears throat> and I said, I would like to paraphrase Winston Churchill's description of John Foster Dulles. John Foster Dulles was the chief uh, secretary of state under Eisenhower. And I said, Joe is the only bull that I know who brings his own china shop with him. <laughs> well, that got a nice ovation, uh -huh. and I'm looking at Joe, and he wasn't smiling, and then all of a sudden he started. <laughs> <laughs> he got it. He got it. <laughs> but uh, there were some problems when Joe came. Uh -huh. uh, I mean, and you were probably right in the thick of it. I was. Um, you got to remember now, Joe... When, when Bill Altmaier was retiring, and there's some question of whether they were forcing him out or whether he was really voluntarily retiring. He'd been chairman. I can't remember how long, 25 years, 20, 20, yeah, whatever years. And um, <coughs> there had never been an outside chairman. And the, I think the committee in the medical school finally had enough money to attract somebody from the outside. And they were determined to have somebody from the outside. Uh, Wes Alexander and I were the internal candidates, but I think both of us knew from the beginning Right. We, we both knew what had to be done and could have done it, but as far as forming a group and, you know, doing all the things that had to get rid of the deadwood, but um, they were determined to have an outside guy. But the the search went on for three years, which was very bad. Um, Altmaier was a lame duck chairman. We had trouble getting residents. Mm -hmm. The faculty were, they weren't resigning, but they were drifting away. You know, they mm -hmm. would hardly ever show up for things. And, right, yeah. And uh, so Joe came in. What wasn't a very good situation, you know. I think the uh, whatever you want to take the deteriorating physical plant, the deteriorating patient load, uh, the faculty, and everything was um, uh, not in good shape. And and Joe was um, uh, well, you knew him obviously, and pr pr people have seen the his re uh, interview. They know him a little bit too. But he was he was a uh, confrontational, charge ahead guy, and. Um, he uh, did not mind conflict at all, but he but he picked a lot of bad bad ones to mm -hmm. to uh, to do things that could have been compromised or would not have been a big deal, turned out to be. Right. Uh, so early on, yes, I uh, did all I could to smooth his way, uh, uh, both uh, in the medical center and in the community, mm -hmm. uh, because I had good ties throughout the community, and um, and Charlie Barrett was great. Charlie Barrett, uh, <coughs> who um, uh, was a very influential man, not only in Cincinnati, but throughout the Midwest uh, and nationally, really. Uh, <clears throat> it was, and it was, uh, was very helpful trying to keep Joe above water because he, he could easily have been out of here in a year or so. Uh, oh, yeah. I mean, uh, th there would be death meetings when he would make residents cry. No. Oh. I mean, just, just murder them mm -hmm. up there. And that... Uh, you know, a couple of us had talks with him about it, yeah. and he wasn't going to budge on some of that stuff. But uh, you're right. There was a difference in the residency. And uh, Joe, despite what a lot of people said about him, did change the department from uh, no staff or minimal staff involvement to lots of staff involvement. Mm -hmm. 
and uh, it became more, uh, it was always deemed a national program, but it became more of a truly national program mm. under Joe's leadership. Um, and That's all true. I came in 1978. I got out of the Navy in 78 April, and Joe came in September of 78. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, at that time, it was basically he and I were the only ones over here. Everybody else was at the homes. Mm -hmm. And I was over here because I didn't have anything to do. <laughs> <laughs> and, well, you were uh, in charge of the residence then? Right. Yeah. I volunteered for that job. Yeah. Or I didn't volunteer. I went to tell Joe he had to do something about it. Yeah. And, um, you know, I said, you need Dr. Culbertson. is a really great guy, but all he does is make out the schedule. Yeah. And I said, we're not getting anywhere. We've got to recruit new residents. We've got to have programs. He said, great. You're the new director of the <laughs> residency. <laughs> and I was that for about six years. But... Uh, <clears throat> He really did raise the bar. He I did. Think. Really raised the bar, not only in residence uh, recruitment, but staff recruitment. And, and a lot of us saw that, and that's why we tried to, to keep him on. You right. saw it, and yeah. I, I did too. And uh, no, I know you were a big uh, supporter of his. I think that there, uh, in many ways, he would have probably been out on his butt if you hadn't been helping him. It could well be. I think between you and Henry, you guys tried to keep yeah, him Yeah, Henry out. not at, at first, <laughs> but it, later on, Henry was even more influential than I was. Yeah. Um, so I think that there were changes in the residency program. There was the good, there was probably the bad, and there were some ugly moments. Mm -hmm. But I think overall it, uh, it changed dramatically. Well, he formed, he formed a practice group, right. know, which really was um, important. Right. Yeah, he brought that together for sure. The new hospital w uh, was actually built, I think, in 71 or 72. Mm -hmm. So we moved out of the general and went into the new general mm -hmm. down the street a little bit. Uh, but then came, <clears throat> when Joe came on board, he really pushed to change it from the general to the university hospital. Right. What were the politics and problems of doing that? There had to be some. And there were. Um, uh, there were some people, uh, like Bill Altmaier. Um, he liked the, he thought all the, the Cincinnati General has such a good name as a teaching center, we really shouldn't lose it. You know, he, and uh, there were a few other people felt that way, but not many. I mean, most people were ready for it to become the university hospital. Uh, I think there was some town uh, displeasure with it, uh, you know, uh, thinking we were trying to sound pompous or something, you know, because mm -hmm. here it was just charity hospital. We had not yet started to admit private patients. That came a little later. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> and so, um, and I was chairman of the name change committee. No were you? Yeah. And uh, so <clears throat> we, um, mainly our job was, uh, to get it out to the public and to, uh, to the TV and newspapers and uh, we and we I, uh, Marie Brown and a few other people in the administrative office we would watch and if the uh, television guy said somebody was taking the general hospital we'd we'd send them a little note or a little something say whoops you you missed it you know <laughs> right <laughs> right I remember that yeah. I remember that. Uh, I think I even saw somebody on air get corrected by one of the other anchors. <coughs> That's right. The, um, uh, did you ever work with Jeff Matthews or was Jeff? Uh, no, Jeff came after, uh, after, Joe was still chairman when I retired and then I, I kept an office here. Uh, I was still on the, uh, uh, I was the only doctor on the board of the university hospital. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, and when I was doing that for about four years and I was still on the board of Cincinnati Bell and some other things here in town. And um, so I was in Florida most of the time, but I'd fly back and forth. and. Uh, be to meetings and things like that. But uh, uh, then uh, Joe was leaving and um, I couldn't justify keeping my office here. Like I was here so seldom. Mm -hmm. And um, so I just, at that, about four years after I had retired, I really stopped coming uh, mm -hmm. to the hospital. And so that's when Matthews came. And so I really, I knew him. I mean, we had lunch together and we, uh, we uh, talked about things, uh, mm -hmm. but, uh, but I, I didn't ever work with him. Yeah. We'd like to get him back here sometime for an interview. Yeah, but that'd and, be good. Uh, just to make sure we've got a continuum mm -hmm. of, uh, of chairman. Um, well, you did spend how many years as chief of the medical staff? About six, I think. Did you? The last, the last six years. You must have been heavily medicated at that time, the last <laughs> six years. No, they asked me when I retired uh, what I missed. And I said, well, interestingly enough, I do not miss the operating room. I thought I would, but uh -huh. I really don't. I, which I guess tells you there's more stress and strain right. than, you, than you know. Oh, I agree with you 100%. Uh, and, um, but I did miss the patients because uh, the last, again, six years or so, uh, I did nothing but uh, 
breast surgery at the breast ran the breast center. Mm -hmm. And so I saw a certain number of ladies who came back every six months or whatever, and I got right. to know them pretty sure, well. Sure, right, yeah. And uh, so I missed them, and I missed the doctors coming to complain to me at lunch every day. I mean, uh -huh. that's we'd sit down at lunch and we'd sit down and start telling me all the things were wrong and right. things we needed to do. Did you, uh, who were some of the medical, the chief of medical administrators that you work with? Was Vito Rallo one of them? Yeah, or? Vito was, was there, and uh, yeah, that's funny, I haven't thought of their names for a while. Uh, oh, God, who was a nice little guy from Chicago, who, he was uh, short. Yeah, fellow. right, I, I know who you're talking about. I can't, I, can't, I, can't I didn't, either. I should have looked their names up before Yeah, right. It, it well, I along. didn't know I was going to ask that question. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but I remember Vito very well because yeah. he was uh, Vito a real, was a, yeah, he was sort of a he was tough a, guy. Yep, he would come around on the floors and uh, really get things yeah, going. Yeah, he was the administrator. When we did the ch name change, he was the administrator. Yeah. Uh, well, tell us a little bit more about Charlie Barrett. Uh, you knew him very well. I did. Not only from medicine, but from socially, I'm yes. sure. Yes. And he, here was a radiation oncologist with an appointment in the Department of Surgery. He was. Uh, a lot of people wonder how that happened. I know he was a very close friend of Dr. Aldemeyer's. Um, and he was a member of the department. He was chairman of the University of Cincinnati Board of Trustees. He was chairman or president of Western and Southern Life Insurance. He was. So he was a very influential community person as well as medical. Very, very. So what do you remember about Charlie? Well, I knew, uh, you know, I, I can't even remember where I first met Charlie. It goes back so far, but I, I knew him from way back. Um, I used to, since I lived on the eastern side of town, I used to go out to Our Lady of Mercy Hospital and see some patients out there in Marymount, when it was in Marymount. And he was... He ran the radiology out there. He oh, wasn't okay. there that often, but right, he, yeah. he ran the radiology. I got to know him there, and, and I'd, I'd even um, uh, known him some other places. And then um, uh, I operated on his wife. I oper operated on um, uh, Will, who's the, um, no, he, Will's the head of the, of the uh, cancer center. Cancer center. Yeah, I, Barrett, I took yeah. his spleen out when oh. he was sled riding one night. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, and he was about a teenager, a young kid, and um, he ruptured his spleen. Um, and uh, so I, I, um, I really got to know him uh, very well. And, and in fact, Charlie, when he went off, he was on the board of uh, Cincinnati Bell Telephone. And um, when he went off the board, he, he was influential in having me take his place. So that oh, was, okay. So that was uh, very good. But I'd known him. And you're right, he was very influential, both medically, politically, any way you want to name it. Mm -hmm. You know, I think he... Uh, he was involved, I guess, with uh, the name change at the university, I mean, the university hospital, as I recall. Yeah, yeah. And this may be an apocryphal story, but I've been told this, that uh, he was at a meeting with Joe Fisher when Joe first brought that idea up. And uh, I don't know if he was in favor of it immediately. I know he was in favor of it later. Mm -hmm. But uh, according to someone who was there, Charlie looked at Joe and said, Joe, I can see it now. I'm walking up Fifth Street. I get chest pain. And I fall down on Fountain Square. And the ambulance boys come and they pick me up and I tell them, take me to the general. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, back then, the general emergency room was... Uh, <laughs> it was everybody uh, knew... Uh, that if you had any kind of serious trauma or serious problem, oh, that absolutely. was the place to go. It was the only real emergency room that had physicians there full time and yeah. uh, the rest of the emergency rooms were spotty at best. Well, you probably got some pretty exciting stories about being in, working in the emergency room in general, haven't you? Oh, well, sure. The, uh, we um, <clears throat> One in particular stick out that you remember? Uh, well, I, I remember the Beverly Hills fire. Oh, Lord. Yeah. Uh, the, um, uh, I, was, uh, no, I was on the faculty then and uh, was actually uh, in charge of burn and trauma. Uh -huh. And uh, so that was that was both of them, and uh, and they, we got the call that there's this big fire, and so I came into the hospital, and uh, we were all set for all these truckload of patients to come. I think we got seven. Mm -hmm. uh, basically, uh, very few people got out, and they, right. all, and they all died of smoke inhalation. Right. Um, <clears throat> in fact, the ones that we had that were the worst were the smoke inhalation patients, and. Um, uh, but we had uh, we did have seven patients that night, and it, it was uh, some of them were in pretty bad shape. Some of them were not too bad, but um, uh, we lost. I think one one died almost within 
12 hours from terrible smoke inhalation. There's nothing you could do. Another guy, I can remember well, we got him through everything and he was getting ready to leave the hospital and keeled over and, and, and died and couldn't be resuscitated oh, from a heart yeah. attack. Oh, totally yeah. unrelated probably. Yeah, right, yeah. An yeah. older patient. I shouldn't say older now that yeah, <laughs> he was right, younger yeah. than I am. At More this mature point. is a good way to do it. <laughs> Well, the, uh, I recall when the TWA plane crashed going into mm. Greater Cincinnati Airport. That's true, too. Yeah. Uh, I was uh, on the burn service as a student, mm -hmm. and we thought we were going to get all kinds of patients from that. Uh, I think we got one burn patient, a terrible burn, about 60%, yeah. uh, a yeah. P&G executive. Right. Um, Pete Link. Pardon? Uh, Pete Link was his name, was I remember. Name? Yeah, I knew him. He was a charming guy. He was still yeah. very with it when he arrived. Yeah. And, uh, That's a sad part. And uh, I think we got one other one, and, and uh, the orthopedic service got somebody with an open femur, an open mm -hmm. leg somewhere along yeah. the line. But you're right, you have a big disaster like that, and you just don't get very many no. people from those things. Um, well, I think all of us would agree that at some point in our careers, either in high school, college, medicine, or residency, we've got someone who really influenced us and in the way we went, made, made our turn, so to speak. So tell me if you have uh, one or two mentors, people in your life who really made a big influence on, on exactly where you've ended up. Well, I'd have to say that uh, <coughs> the, um, I got interested in, in medicine because just through a family physician who was a friend of my parents and they were they did things together. I got to know him, and I, uh, and he was a nice fellow. And I saw what he did, and I thought, well, that'd be fun to do. Uh, and so that was how I, I first got interested. Um, I would say that um, uh, actually Max Zinninger was pretty influ influential. Why he uh, um, <coughs> interviewed me uh, for residency uh, when I was medical student, and uh, um, he. Um, I was interested in surgery, and uh, I'd been a, um, as a medical student in those days, if a, when a resident, uh, maybe it was the interns, the interns got two weeks uh, vacation, but they had to find a medical student to take their place. <laughs> <coughs> so uh, I did that a couple of times. And, um, uh, and then uh, as far as developing, once I uh, was a resident and on the faculty, I'd have to say Bill Altmaier was the main influence. Mm -hmm. Uh, there were others, of course, but he was he was the main one. If you could think of uh, <clears throat> one thing in your entire surgical career, and this is a tough question because there's probably dozens, what would be the, the highlight of your surgical career? What was the thing that's been most important to you in your scientific surgical career? Um, actually, probably some of the most important things I didn't appreciate at the time, you know. Uh -huh. Right, yeah. Um, I remember... Um, I was in the Army, and I, when I went in the Army, I'd only had, I'd had two years of residency, mm -hmm. that's all. So I was not that far along. And um, uh, so I, I got to work down there, and we were doing a paper. I, so I was getting back, I was doing some work on uh, Curling's ulcer, which in the old days, before they were feeding patients by tube drip and keeping the stomach uh, acid down, was a pretty common problem. Uh, and so um, I wrote a paper on the, and they, and it was accepted at uh, the surgical forum at the American College of Surgeons. And so I didn't, I didn't even know. I don't think I'd ever been to a surgical forum before. You know, mm -hmm. so, so I'm up there, and I get up there and get the paper. And God, there must be, this is the biggest room I've, there must be a 800 people in the room. <laughs> right, right, yeah. <laughs> and uh, you know, I, I didn't think much about it. I thought, well, I didn't know any better, you know. So I gave the paper and everything. And, and that, I said, well, that was kind of fun, you know, doing that. And, and um, right. that was, uh, I should do more of this. So. Uh, that kind of got me started on uh, being interested in academic surgery. That up to that point, I really hadn't until uh, I was in the service, and I guess I wrote seven or, or was writing on seven or eight papers in those two years, and um, uh, so that really influenced me um, uh, toward academic mm -hmm. career. Even though the uh, my commanding officer, who was sort of a frustrated academic surgeon, mm -hmm. uh, said. Just going to practice. <laughs> he said, Don't get into that. He said, "You think it's an ivory tower, but it, I, it, I tell you, it's not all that easy and not that fun, and and there's a lot of uh, a lot of ups and downs." Right. And, uh, 
but uh, but that it did influence me into, into going in uh -huh. there. So I'd say that, that that was one of the turning points. Okay. Uh, they say that uh, the reason academic uh, politics are so vicious is because there's nothing at stake. <laughs> <laughs> May well be. Um, well, let's talk about your family a little bit. Oh, okay. Uh, you were married to your lovely wife, Helen. You, you uh, got married in 1954, and then she passed away in 2006. That's right. And I think it was lymphoma, is that right? That she no, actually, uh, she had a she had Hodgkin's uh, lymphoma about 20 years before that. Oh, okay. Uh, in fact, uh, Joe Fisher, she and Joe Fisher got along well. In fact, they were. They, oh, I remember. They were they were at each other a lot. Right. But uh, uh, they got along. In fact, he told her when he he operated on her for the lymphoma, uh, Hodgkin's lymphoma, and he was going over further treatment and that sort of thing. And as she's leaving the room, he said, "Oh, and don't worry about dying. You're too honorary to die." <laughs> 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 so right. he did have a sense of humor, yeah. but. Um, <clears throat> yes, and uh, she, but she had um, she had complications from uh, uh, actually two things: the radiation therapy that she'd had in those days, and she had uh, a GI problems from that, and a gastric ulcer, and gast uh, atonic uh, stomach, and oh, uh, boy. and then she she basically died a heart heart attack. Mm -hmm. Oh man! Well, she was a terrific gal. Gee, Thank many you. Christmas. Yes, I thought so. The residents loved her, mm -hmm. <laughs> as you know. Yeah. Uh, but you have three children. I do. Uh, do you want to tell us about Claire, Molly, and Rob? <laughs> uh, well, uh, uh, they're all older people now. Rob's the youngest, and he's 51. Uh -huh. um, he's a plastic surgeon here in, in the community uh, uh, with a group of six uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, plastic surgeons and seems to be happy um, and doing okay. Uh, Claire is a, a mother who worked for a number of years in advertising both in Chicago and Cincinnati. But uh, once she had her two children, uh, uh, she kind of concentrated on that. But now they're uh, one's out of college as of uh, a week ago, uh -huh. and uh, the other one's about to be a senior. So now she's uh, teaching Taekwondo to little kids, uh -huh. and uh, she ha runs a um, neighborhood newspaper, the Marymount Town Crier. Oh, okay. She, she owns that now and publishes it, and. Uh, so uh, she's, uh, she's doing fine. And Molly, unfortunately, is in Lexington, Kentucky. And unfortunately, uh, her husband uh, dropped dead at the age of 47. Oh, my. Uh, which was, um, uh, you know, he was smoked and was overweight and all those things. Uh, but um, he was, you know, going to give it all up. Right. At yeah. any time now. Yeah. But didn't get a chance. And um, uh, so she is working and uh, uh, seems to be doing all right. Mm -hmm. um, has two children who are who are both out and oh, working. Oh boy, that's really tough, I'm sure. Yeah. So you have four grandchildren or more? Uh, six, actually. Six. Each one of the kids has two. Two, okay. And it sounds like they're uh, not quite young adults. Maybe they are. They are. They're all, um, they're all out of college except for the uh, youngest one who's uh, going to be a senior. She's 20. Uh -huh. And uh, uh, none of them are uh, married, but one I think will be married uh, this year. Okay. Well, good. And I understand, or I know, that you have a, a lovely new lady in your life. Oh, I do, a, yes, a lovely lady, a um, uh, lady that I have known in uh, Florida. Uh -huh. um, in fact, I first really met her uh, in 2001. Uh, we did a little uh, Follies uh, show down in Florida where we sing and do little parodies, and uh, she and I were both in the show. Helen actually directed it uh -huh. and produced it, uh, so I knew her then, and then... Um, uh, a few months after Helen passed away, I was back in Florida, and she asked if I wanted to, she's a widow uh -huh. uh, uh, lady, and her husband passed away about six years, six years before that, and um, asked if I wanted to be her partner in a golf game or something, and uh -huh. I did, and then uh, we went to a movie one night, and then we just started going out, yeah. and it's gone very well. Well, I can tell you, Denny is a lovely lady. Thank you. And... Uh, you're a pretty good guy with the ladies, I'm telling you. You've oh, got a you good know, picking. Well, you're a young yeah. guy like me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, let's, uh, let's kind of end up with uh, any hobbies that you have. And uh, the first thing that comes to my mind is golf. Golf is um, a wonderful sport when you're retired. It's, uh, uh, it's not so good when you're working because it takes, it you takes, know, a, lot it takes a lot of time. You, round takes four hours, and then there's time before and time after. And so you, it winds up taking most of the day which is tough when you're working, but it's great when you're retired. Right, sure. Uh, and so um, 
Uh, I'm, I enjoy being in Florida. I don't know what I'd do up here all winter. I, I'd probably have to come over here and volunteer or something. <laughs> um, God forbid. <laughs> that's right. Uh, but in Florida, I play golf uh, five days a week and uh-huh. play bridge a couple of days a week. And uh, there are a lot of other social things going on and do a little traveling. And uh-huh. But the golf does uh, fill in a lot of time, and it's a lot of fun. I, I enjoy it. Oh, great. Anything else? So we, we talked to Ed Miller when we interviewed Ed, former chief of orthopedics, right. and uh, his hobby is horses. Oh, really? He still rides regularly and keeps a couple of horses and uh, very active. I used He's to ride. In fact, uh, <laughs> well, well, tell us a little bit about Helen and her horse. Uh, the, Helen was, uh, liked to ride, and, and Helen, um, uh, I, as a, I got her into the thoroughbred business, too. You know, I know you know about that. Oh, no, I do. Uh, yeah. uh, <clears throat> for one of her uh, birthday, I guess, uh, she loved horses and liked going to Keeneland to the races and that sort of thing. And so I got her a share in a stallion who was going to Sud. And um, not very expensive, you know, a few thousand dollars and uh, compared to what they usually are. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> right. But this one happened to hit it big, and all of a sudden he's making all kind of money, which is very unusual in the horse right. thoroughbred business. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> you, see, you never put any money in that you plan, you need in any That's way. Right, you know? yeah. uh, but this one worked out, and, and uh, so that with that money we had other horses, and uh, we ran some horses, and, and she enjoyed it all, which uh-huh. was great. And uh, <clears throat> so we were able to do that, and that was wonderful. We did that for about 22 years or so. Yeah. And, um, had a lot of fun going to the farms and going to the races all over the country. And, uh, so that was a lot of fun. And she, she and I rode we, um, in the Army at Brook Army Hospital when we were first married. Uh, they had the Boots and Saddle Club. Boots really? and Saddle Club, you um, joined for $5 a year, and it cost you a dollar every time you went riding just to have them saddle the horse. You could ride all day. You know, uh-huh. They didn't care. Uh, we rode all over the parade grounds and through the woods and that sort of thing. So, and that was her first riding. I'd ridden a lot when I was a kid, but uh, uh-huh. uh, and we and uh, we kind of kept that up until um, um, more recent times. But I was on a, at a dude ranch and a couple of years ago with Denny, and um, they said, "Well, now there's a there's just a, uh, the scenic ride, and there's the intermediate ride, and then there's the adventure ride." And I thought, "Well." I hadn't ridden for 30 years, but I thought, well, I'm a, I'm a rider, you know. So right, yeah. I got on the adventure ride. I was not a rider anymore. <laughs> <coughs> I stayed on the horse, but yeah. that's the first time I ever had to hold on to the pommel oh. <laughs> to, uh, to stay on. Uh, so I strictly I moved back. <laughs> yeah, first step back from that. Yeah, it'll be the merry-go-round for you. Huh? That's right. <laughs> well, Bob, this has been absolutely a delight, and we're so happy you took the time. Tomorrow you're going to be talking to Grand Rounds at UC. I am and um, covering some of the stuff that we talked yes, about today. we'll cover some of this. And uh, we look forward to that. And thanks so much thank for you. coming. Thank you. It was a pleasure. And thank you for joining us.